Let's start today's lecture. We shall start by quickly reviewing the past lecture. And then today we shall be concluding our discussion on the A star search and particularly looking at its performance and the optimality condition, which I've mentioned briefly last time, whether it was an optimal search algorithm or not. That wasn't quite clear. Um, once we're done with that, uh, we will start looking at what are referred to as local search problems. So uh, this is now in chapter four of your text. We'll be looking at various algorithms such as beam search, hill climbing, uh, simulated annealing, and perhaps genetic algorithms if we get to that. So um, this is just a quick review of the past uh, notes that we had. We looked at uh, uninformed search, informed search. Uh, in particular, we looked at uh, uniform search, best first search, and A star search last time. Uh, and we looked at the um, how one can improve the DFS, the BFS, DFS algorithm. And we looked at hopefully your um, assignment one is in progress. You also created a WhatsApp group. So anyone who's not in the WhatsApp group, please do join that. Uh, link was sent out using the LMS email. Uh, your TA is supposed to be helping you, or uh, Nida is supposed to be helping you with that if necessary. Uh, we looked at iterative deepening search. We looked at the frog jumping uh, puzzle. I was given out my homework. Then the breadth depth search that I had sort of come up with. Um, and then we looked at uniform cost, cost search. Um, and then we looked at um, the uh, heuristics. Now we get into the heuristics part where we're talking about informed searches. Right, and we spoke at length about what exactly is a heuristic. Okay, and um, somebody at the end also discussed with me that heuristic is sort of um, a human way of looking at searches. Okay, so uh, I think in all of these heuristic searches, there is a human element involved. Okay, but perhaps uh, I'm not sure, but I don't think it's just restricted human level intuition. It's quite possible that you know, especially with uh, machine learning. If you give enough heuristic examples to an AI engine, then it might be able to come up with its own heuristic heuristics. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily the H doesn't necessarily have to stand for human. Okay, that's just my thought. Um, and we looked at different heuristic functions, um, and then we looked at the greedy algorithm, which was simply using the heuristics. Okay, so uh, remember this is sort of like the uniform search, uh, which is, what is the uniform search doing? It's, it's going in all the directions, but it's trying to look, it's, it's going in the direction where the cost is the least, okay? But as you get to a particular point where the cost starts to become too high, then what does it do? It does keep track of the past searches, okay? So it does backtrack and go into other search areas where the cost was lower. So this is the basic concept uh, behind all of these algorithms that it is keeping track of all the of all the fringe elements. Okay, we talked about this fringe. So it's, it's looking at all the unexplored searches and still keeping track of that. So that was the basis of uniform cost search and that goes on into the greedy search. The basic concept in the greedy search is that instead of looking at the actual cost, we switch to a, a greedy mechanism, which we calling the heuristic, okay? It's not looking at anything else. And we said that uh, the A star search, which is a combination of the, the uh, earlier uniform cost search, which was rep uh, represented by G of N over here, okay? And then it also added H of N, which represented the greedy search. So it was a combination of uniform cost search, as well as the greedy search, and it came up with a new function, which was a combination of the two. And then we discussed whether uh, it seems to be better. And we ended the last lecture by looking at an example where it chose uh, the route ADF based on uh, the, this function, this cost. And it saw that um, the cost of F of C was 20 
plus 15. So 20 was the, you know, the um, uniform cost portion, okay? And H of C was the heuristic portion, and it came out to be uh, 35. And then it looked at F of D, and it saw that the cost over here was 10, and 20 was the cost of the heuristic. And so this was uh, 30. And so it switched back to the open search. So C was already left, okay? And it switched back to that and it found out then, and then eventually, and this is where I, I mentioned at the end that eventually it got to F, okay? And it calculated the total cost, the actual cost. So it looked at 20 plus 25 and it got 45, okay? And it looked at the compared that it's still compared. It hasn't stopped yet. Okay. It's still looking at the unexplored, the fringe. And the fringe consists of F of D. And it's and it compared it with this cost versus 45. Um, sorry, a little, little mistake over here. So it's going through D. Uh, let me backtrack over here. It's not looking at this cost over here. It's chosen D and it's got to the destination, okay? And it's now going to compare the actual cost, 20 plus 15, which is 35, okay? And it's going to compare it with F of C, okay? This is still open. So um, is this, does this seem to be uh, as good? 10 plus 15, that's 25. Okay, that's not 35. You need to correct me if I'm making a mistake. Okay, so it got to F via D and it found out the actual cost of getting to, to F via D was yeah, F plus 15. It's not using a heuristic now. It's calculating the actual cost because once you get there, you actually figure out what the actual cost is, right? So 10 plus 15 is 25. Now it's going to compare that with the open uh, search costs, okay? So it's found that in the fringe was 20 plus 15, which was 35. Now 35 over here, which was over here, is higher than 25, okay? So now it knows that I have gotten to the destination in the, most likely in the cheapest mechanism, okay? Now, the question remained whether um, once you, because when you, it decided on D, it didn't really know this particular portion, right? It didn't really know the actual cost of going from D to F. And it's only when you actually traverse that, that you find out what the actual cost is. And so my open question at the end was that what if this, instead of being 15, it was some large number, right? Suppose it was 40. So the actual cost of getting here would have been 40 plus 10, which would have been 50. In that case, what would it have done? It would have compared it with the heuristic based cost of the fringe. And it would have said, well, this cost over here going through C indicated that I could get to F at a cost of 35, okay? And I've actually gotten there at a much higher cost, 50. So this is not the best search. I'm going to go back and I'm going to come over here to C and then pursue this. And then once it goes through C and gets to the destination, what is the actual cost? It's going to be 20 plus 25, which is 45, okay? And is this better than 50? which was the previous version with, with 15 being replaced by 40. So it found out that yes, now C is actually better. Even though the heuristic was telling me that going through D is better, but when I actually got there, I found out that there was a problem in the last leg, I backtracked and then I found the route through C and that turned out to be actually better than the actual cost of getting to F via D. Okay, so I hope the whole process is clear. I haven't actually given you a detailed implementation. Then you don't really care, right? Because you've got to to the destination uh, with uh, with an, a, a cost which could have been, you know, a lot of times when you go through a GPS, it tells you that you can get to this, but there's an alternate path which is of equal timing. Then you don't care, right? Then you might as well toss a coin. 
but in that case, you've got to the destination in the in the least cost. So as long as the least cost, uh, if there are other costs which are equal, you don't care. But if there's another cost which is lower, then you do care. Yeah. So, so here, basically, the cost is all in all. It is actually encapsulating any cost parameter that you can imagine. So it could be, it depends on what, how you define cost. We have made it simple, we haven't defined it, but it is most likely it could be the time, okay? But as was discussed earlier, it could be something else. For example, you don't care about the time, you can you're going to Starbucks from Karachi, and you, you're concerned about how much toll there is or how much petrol is going to take. You have all the time, you know? So in that case, your cost parameter would be defined as, you know, actual monetary cost, okay? So it depends on how you define cost. But let's assume over here that, you know, that, that's not an object of discussion, okay? But so you understood A star cost, all in all, how it's operating. I hope that's clear, okay? Now, the next question is, is this an optimal cost? Okay. So um, now uh, we were discussing the issue of whether um, is it complete? Yes, it is complete. Worst case uh, time complexity. And we discussed that because it's going through possibly dead ends, the worst case time complexity, which we haven't calculated, but can be done is actually exponential. Okay. Now the question is whether it's optimal or not. Okay. And let's try to investigate that. Uh, basically, there's a condition which is called admissibility, okay? And admissibility says that HN never overestimates the actual cost of getting to the goal state, okay? So if you define, if you make sure that your um, heuristic doesn't overestimate um, the actual cost, okay? Um, and I saw a good example of that is um, if you're essentially saying that you're going to the market and looking for something and you go to the first person and um, you have a certain idea about the actual cost, okay? Now, if your expectation is less than what is being offered, okay, uh, and the person is giving a very high price, you will go to another person, okay? But if you had initially estimated a very high cost, okay? You thought it was very expensive. And the guy was actually, the actual cost is lower than the first person that you're going to go to, you're probably going to say, well, this is fine. I'm going to stick with that, okay? You're not even going to explore other person simply because your heuristic was, uh, under, was uh, uh, an overestimate, okay? You thought this was really expensive. So that's sort of the, the, you know, the intuition behind this, this admissibility condition. And let's see how it works out, okay? So uh, this is a case that we've already seen. And here, let's take a look uh, if the admissibility condition is actually being met. So H of N has to be less than H star of N. H star of N is simply the actual cost, okay? The actual cost of getting from N to the destination. Okay, so let's make this assumption. So the first question is, is this admissible? Is this scenario, does it satisfy the admissibility condition? Does it satisfy the admissibility condition? Which means that H of C, and this has to be done for all the neighbors, okay? Is H of C uh, less than the actual cost? Yes, it is, right? 15 is less than 20. Okay, uh, for the other neighbor, is H of D the heuristic, the heuristic of going from here to here, is that act less than the actual cost of going from D to F? Again, yes, okay. So the admissibility condition over here has been met. So now let's see, does it actually find the optimal cost? And I think this is the same example that we looked at before. So this is 15, 10, 10, 15, 15. So we, uh, no, this is slightly different. I've made it slightly different. So let's do the, the calculations. F of C would be what? 10 plus, plus what? 
plus the 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 the, the cost the the a star cost of going through c is now based on what remember it's a combination of uniform plus greedy the uniform cost says that we're going to use the act, the cost from going to a to c all right the greedy says that i'm going to use the heuristic so it's a sum of these two so what is the cost the a star cost of going by c 10 plus 15 right it's going to use 10 plus 15 so this is going to be 25 what's the a star cost of going through d 10 plus 10 right so it's going to be 10 plus 10 which is 20 so uh, which path is it going to choose it's going to use d okay so once it's chosen D, uh, it's going to get to the destination. And at the destination, what is it going to do? It's going to calculate the actual cost of, of getting to D, right? So this is basically, you can think of it as G of, um, of F, right? Plus the, uh, uh, you can also add the heuristic of getting from F to F, okay? So this would be what? The actual cost of getting to F is what now? Actual cost of getting to F, we've already chosen this particular path. So we've chosen, we're going through D. What's the actual cost of getting to F through D? 40. It's going to be 40, so it's going to be 10 plus 30. And what's the heuristic portion of it? To get from F to F? Oh, heuristic says a certain cost to get to the destination. Now you're already at the destination. So what's the heuristic going to be? Zero. Zero, somebody answered correctly. It's actually going to be zero, right? Because you're already at the destination. So getting to the destination from the destination, the cost is going to be zero, okay? So the total cost over here is coming out to be 40, all right? So this is now the at the destination. Now it's going to compare this with what? What's the open, the fringe? It's going to look at existing paths that it had already, it had not explored completely. Okay, the, the, the cost of going through C, which was based on the A star cost, which was what? What is the cost of, what was the expected cost of going, of getting to F through C? Was 25, right? So it's going to say is, uh, which is better? C is better, right? Because we actually got to the destination and somehow we had underestimated, well, we, we our heuristic over here was 10, but the actual cost was very high, okay? So we actually took the wrong path. So now we're going to backtrack and we're going to say, Let's look at the other option. Is there, was there a better option to get to, des to the destination? Uh, and yes, the heuristic says that, yes, there seems to be a better path to get to the destination. Okay, so we're going to switch. We're going to go back over here. Now we're going to go through to the destination via this path. Now, what's the actual cost of getting to the destination um, through C? Is going to be G Perfect. of F plus again, H of F. In this case, this was via D, and this is now via C. So what is this going to be? 30. 10 plus 20. This is the G of F, and what is the heuristic at F is clearly zero. So that's 30. So you found uh, earlier the actual cost was 40. Now we found a shorter way of getting to the destination. Okay, so this was the entire A star algorithm, which was in the case where admissibility is being followed, G. Hmm.
They, okay, so, so take a look at the other case and you'll get a slightly better idea of what's going on, okay? So the ne next example is the case, this is just the same example that I've shown you. This is the case if admissibility is not followed, okay? This is the case where you go into the market and the first guy, and your estimation was that this equipment is extremely expensive, right? But the actual cost is lower. So the question is, will you get to the actual cost, to the, to the cheapest, you know, cheapest equipment that you're looking for in the market. So here uh, is admissibility for being followed. I've given you the solution over here, but double check. Uh, this says that we've changed the heuristic over here, which was earlier 15. And now we've changed it to 40. Okay. So what, uh, so is 40, how does that compare with 20? Earlier 15 was less than 20, right? Now 40 is actually the heuristic of getting to F via C is now higher than the actual cost. So admissibility is not being met, okay? So this is not admissible because H of D over here, uh, because H of C here is greater than 20. Similarly, H of D, I've changed it from 10, which was the case earlier, okay? And I've increased it to 35. So now your heuristics are really high. You, you're thinking everything is, you have, you're pessimistic in a sense. You, you have the worst in mind, okay? So you've gone to the market and you're looking for uh, a real, you're expecting the worst. So your heuristics over here are 35. Um, and this clearly is greater than 30. The actual cost of going from D to F is 30, but your estimate was D to F is 35. So admissibility is not being maintained on both of these. Whereas the condition was that admissibility should be there in all of the link, all of the neighbors, all paths, okay? So now let's do the, again, the test and see if we can actually find the optimal path. So help me out over here. What is F of C? 10 plus 40 is going to be 50. What's F of D? 10 plus 35 which is 45, which path are we going to take? We're going to pay, pick D, okay? So we take this path and just make sure I'm not making any mistakes. We take this particular path and now what are we going to do? We, we get to the destination, we, we calculate the actual cost, okay? The actual cost over here is how much? 10 plus 30 plus zero, okay, so this is 40. And this is uh, via D, via D. And now what are we going to say? Are we going to stop over here? No, we have to explore all the open paths, okay? The fringe, okay? The fringe, one of the fringes was F of C. This is where we had left the, the we, had, we hadn't explored C fully. Okay, so you have to keep going back as in the uniform cost. When you get to the destination, right? Go back to uniform cost. When you get to the destination, you still have to see whether the actual cost was the cheapest or did, do you have any other fringe which was of a lower cost? Okay, this is being done throughout the last two algorithms, both in, in the uniform and the greedy cost. Okay, so you look, so you look at the open fringe, you look at that C, there was a path available through C. Now, what was the cost? What was the expected cost to go through C? It was 50. Now, what are you going to do? You're not going to explore C because your estimate was that if I go through C, it's going to cost me 50. Now, why do you think you actually didn't explore going through C? What's the bottom line? What's, what's the reason? Why? The, the heuristic was, was an overestimate, was too high, okay? So your heuristic over here was actually 40. Now, if your heuristic was, was, lower, than, was lower than the actual cost, if, if it was, let's say, 10 plus 15 and it was 25, okay, then we would have realized that it's better to go through C. But since our heuristic was too high uh, because basically we're comparing the actual cost to get to the destination with our 
heuristic based cost. Okay, and if our heuristic remember is not admissible, it's too high, then we're going to think that these other paths are you know too ex too expensive. So we're not even we're not even going to explore those paths. Okay, so simply because this cost was too high, f of c was was fifty, we didn't switch over here. We didn't switch there. Okay, so we stuck with uh, the path through d, and in fact d was was a cost of 40. And we know that if we actually had gotten through C via C, it would have actually cost us 10 plus 20, which was 30. And that was clearly smaller than 40, okay? So we ended up, because we took a large, a high heuristic, we ended up with not exploring some of the alternate paths. Does that answer your question? No, you're right. I, I've given you a specific example. I haven't actually given you a, a proof of their argument, okay? The proof is beyond the, the scope of this course, honestly. Uh, but if you're interested in the proof, all I'm showing you is that it does work in some cases. But if you actually want to have a rigorous proof, then you can, perhaps I can give you some links to a paper or something, okay? And I'm sure that the, the rigorous proof is a lot more tr tricky, okay? Okay, so so your conje your conjecture is that you're not you're not satisfied that this admissibility is actually going to work in all conditions. That, that's what you're saying, and that's a perfectly valid argument because I haven't actually honestly proved this. Okay, I've just told you here's a, a, a random example I've pulled out of a hat, and in these two cases I've shown you that if you're not admissible, you end up with a with a bad with a non-optimal solution. And here is an admissible, and uh, it does give you an optimal. So this is not by any means an, an argument to prove the theorem. Okay, this is just two examples. But if you do want to look at the the um, you know the actual proof, uh, you'd have to explore some more. But that's a good point. Okay, so you should you should you should take my word as the ultimate you know point. This is a good way to think that you you need to think is this is this making sense. But here the intuition should be there. The question is, does the intuition tell you that, um, that this admissibility is working? That's very important. I keep repeating the word intuition. This is, uh, uh, intuition is what is your gut feeling, okay? For every algorithm right from perhaps in class six to by the time you do your PhD, if you do do your PhD or masters, whenever you have an algorithm, you must have an intuition for that, okay? If you, if you go back to basic physics and if you don't have an intuition as to why does gravity work, okay, what's the equation for forces equal to mass into acceleration, then you have a problem because all you're doing is you're taking an equation and you're blindly following it. For every equation, you must have an intuition. And if you don't have that, you haven't really understood it, okay? So please try to follow uh, intuition, try to get an intuitive feel of, the, uh, of every equation that you come across in every course. If you don't have an intuition, ask the, the instructor, can you give me an intuitive answer? Why is this algorithm working? And that's my objective right now is to try to convince you that there is an intuitive answer as to why this is working. And sometimes it's hard to explain the intuition and you know perhaps you get it or you don't, but let me see how many people have think that they have an intuitive answer as to why this is working. Does anybody have an in intuition as to why this is working? Why, why is it that when, when we got here, okay, we actually came with a, with a high cost and when we, we didn't explore this because our, our heuristic was very high, but when you made the heuristic lower than the actual cost, you were forced to explore this. Does anybody have an intuition why this works and does anybody have no clue? So it seems like most people have no clue. Why, why does this intuition work? So think about it again. Uh, you've got, you've found a path, okay? And the path is costing you something. The actual cost is 40, okay? Now, this was clearly, if you just looked at the graph, this was clearly a better path, right? If you just looked at this example, 10 plus 20 is 30. It was clearly a better path, okay? 
but we're not exploring because you know if in, in a in a breadth first search or in informed first search, you have extremely large, uh, you know, you have an extremely large branching factor, so you can't look at all the possible paths, okay? And you know, only need to explore those paths which uh, you would like to, which are which are probably going to give you a good answer, okay? Because you're trying to get you're trying to use heuristic or an informed search to get to a certain destination. And you're trying to, you could have done a breadth first search, but you're trying not to do that, okay? And here, what we've done is we've left this unexplored. Why? Because we had a heuristic which said that this cost is probably too high, okay? We took this path because our heuristic over here, our rule of thumb was this, this seems to be a shorter path, okay? Now, the reason why we didn't explore this is because our heuristic was higher than the actual cost, okay? Now, suppose that the heuristic cost, the A star cost was actually lower, then you would have compared the actual cost of going through D with a heuristic-based cost, which would have definitely be lower than the cost that you've actually gotten through, right? It would have definitely be less than 40 if it was the optimal path, why? Because the, the actual cost, the heuristic cost was less than the actual cost. So you would have ended up with something like 10 plus 15, 25 or 10 plus 10, and you would have been forced to go through that path. Okay, G. So, so yeah, so, so if you look at the past examples, we, we, we looked at some logical, mechanisms, right? So if you go back to, for example, uh, this particular example, right? What was the heuristic over here? We used two heuristics. One was the number of misplaced tiles, and the number, the, the other was the sum of Manhattan distances from goal to the, to the destination tile. So the heuristic has to be generally, if you want to implement it, it has to be something which can be defined, okay? So, so yes, it is a well-defined heuristic. Okay, in the case of the, the examples that we're looking at right now, what are the heuristics that, we, that, I, that I mentioned over here? What are we assuming over here? That the heuristic is sort of like the aerial distance. We were looking at the example that was um, the, the, based on the actual path of getting to a destination, right? And we started off by saying that if you're going through, you would prefer the route A because your heuristic is the shortest path. And it seems like going through A is shorter than going through B. Okay, so you know simply because B is going through a long, it seems to be going through a longer route. So the heuristic could either be uh, an aerial distance in the case of a GPS calculation. It could be uh, in the case of the the eight puzzle. It could be you know uh, different types of heuristics, but it is well defined. G. Yeah. This graph. This one here, okay. Okay, so let's take the heuristic for 30. That's a good question, let's explore it. So that's how, that's how you should test it, okay. So here it says it's 30 plus 40. 30 plus 10 is 40, right? So um, in that case, it's equal, but the requirement is it has to be less than, so you wouldn't explore it, okay. So even if it was 25, what would it be? 10 plus 25, that's 35. And um, in that case, you're coming through here using 40, okay? If it's, um, so in this case, let's take a look. Uh, is this giving you an, an example which is not working? So let's say, okay, sorry, we, we were over here, okay? So that was the wrong example. So here, let's say that we, we took this example and we said, let's not make a, uh, H of C 40, let's make it a little bit bigger than this cost, okay? So let's make it 25, okay? So 25 plus 10 would be 35, all right? And 35 is still lower than the actual cost, which is 40. So, you, so in this case, um, Okay, think with me, is this, is this working? So here we said it's 40 plus 10 is 50. 
So we compared 40 with 50 and we said that we're not going to explore it, okay? Now I'm saying that the heuristic cost is slightly larger than 20, it's 25, okay? And you're going to take 25 plus 10, 35. Okay. And you're going to say, well, is 35 better than this? Yes. So you are going to explore it. So it has worked. However, that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily prove that it will always work. Slight difference, right? In this case, it has worked. So we're not saying that if admissibility is not followed, it will never work, you understand? All we're saying is that if admissibility is followed, it will always give you the optimal solution. That, that's a theorem, okay? So it's, it's good that you're exploring all the possible ways and think about these things in, in exactly the, the kind of ways that you're questioning it, okay? Those are the kind of questions you should ask. And um, the only thing that you need to figure out is if admissibility is met and it is not finding you an optimal solution. So think for a solution like that and, and see if you can prove it otherwise, you know? In other words, admissibility is not being followed, but it is still not giving you the optimal result, okay? If you can do that, you probably can publish a paper, okay? <laughs> because it's going against um, the existing uh, so I was just looking at uh, I was just looking at a YouTube uh, video, and it was talking about you know the philosophy of, of research, and it talked about um, an example of a gentleman um, I forget his name, but he's he's the guy who's actually invented the simplex method, okay, and the, as the story goes, which is actually a true story, he came to class, and um, and he missed the first twenty minutes of the class, okay. And the instructor has had put down two open problems that nobody had solved. Okay, so this chap uh, actually didn't realize that it wasn't a homework assignment. He thought it was a homework assignment, whereas in fact it was a problem which nobody, which was on the open problems. Okay, so he went back and he started working on that problem, and he worked on it for a few days. And because he didn't think that it was an unsolved problem. He worked on it for a few days and actually solved it. And he gave it to the instructor, to the, to the professor, it was either at University of Maryland or Berkeley. And after a few weeks, uh, you know, they called him in and they said, congratulations, you've actually solved one of the open problems in mathematics, which none of the other people had actually solved. So uh, what is the, the key uh, philosophy question over here, or psychology question, is that uh, because the person didn't actually know that this was an unsolved problem. He actually attempted it, okay? Now, if, he, if he, he knew that this was an unsolved problem, do you think he would have even attempted it? Probably not, right? So that's why sometimes it's good to be late in class. <laughs> you know, that's, that's not the conclusion. We can come to another conclusion, but uh, some people think that's one of the conclusions. Anyway, so the bottom line is that um, one shouldn't take any problem for guarantee as guaranteed, okay? Think about it and maybe you'll come up with uh, a counter argument which actually disproves the existing theory, okay? And it can be done by anybody, any, anybody, any student, okay? As was the example of this gentleman. Okay, let's keep going forward. So uh, we've already shown this. Now let's look at going back to our uniform cost and greedy search and tr try to see what are the other algorithms that are revolving around it, okay? So uh, there are a couple of algorithms which are referred to as beam search and local searches, okay? Now let's talk about beam search first uh, because it's a little bit more intuitive. And if you think of local search, it's sort of a subset of beam search, okay? So uh, think about this particular problem which I actually gave you for the homework assignment. Uh, what's happening over here? Uh, basically, you're going through, uh, this is not your assignment, this was the, the actual case of, of a greedy search, is going to uh, go through, uh, let's say the, 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 the heuristics here are H10, H11, and H12. Which one is going to be explored first? H10 is going to go in this direction, but is it going to keep these uh, to be explored later on? 
yes, as I've already explained repeatedly, is going to keep the open searches still there, okay? Now, uh, and then it goes down and keep going down and maybe it gets to the destination, it, maybe it doesn't, okay? If it, uh, if it does go somewhere and the heuristics become very high, the A star search becomes very high, it's going to go through other, other paths which it's going to explore to see if those can give you a better solution. Now, what is the problem with breadth first search? What is the fundamental problem there? Space complexity, because uh, if you have a branching factor, which is very high, uh, you can have an extremely enormous uh, amount of space required, okay? What's the problem over here? Does it have a space problem? Is it keeping all the other paths still open? It is doing that, right? So it's become a little better because it's using heuristics, but still uh, in the worst case scenario, it could actually be using a lot of space, okay? So um, can you think of a method to actually uh, limit the amount of memory that you're using? Can, can one think of a, a method? Here are the heuristics are 10, here's 11, here's 12. Um, let's say if this was not 12, this was 50. Um, can you think of a better method to reduce the amount of space that you're keeping? What is the space being used? It's the space being used for keeping track of C as well as D, right? So can you think of a better method to reduce, a simpler, a simpler method to reduce the amount of space? We can have an upper bound on heuristic. Okay, uh, online, just hold on, just, uh, just give me a minute. Yeah, go on. Right, so a suggestion is that uh, going through D, the heuristics are enormous, right? Does it make sense to keep track of that? No. Uh, somebody online had a suggestion as well? Is that the yeah, same? Yeah, I was saying uh, we can have an upper bound on our heuristics. We can have an upper bound, right? So there are two ways. We can say that uh, the two ways, the first way is that we could say, well, we're going to have a, well, both of you are suggesting the same thing is that if let's say age of 10 and 11 are, if, if some, some path is giving you maybe twice as much of the heuristic cost, heuristic based A star cost, then we're going to uh, forget about it, okay? Another method could be, what could be another method? Suppose this is still 12, okay? It's not, it's not double G. We can rank them. So first of all, we're going to obviously use this particular path, but you're saying let's order them by the, uh, the, the least versus the most cost and then do what? Are we still keeping track of all of them? But then the space requirement is based on the, the, amount, of, the amount that you're keeping track of, G. Okay, so we, so, okay. So the assumption when you're doing A star is that you're always following uh, admissibility. Okay, that's a good point, but admissibility is going to be always assumed. And that's why it's, um, you know, it's a proven theorem, so-called proven theorem, that uh, admissibility has to be required because if you don't have admissibility, it's not going to be optimal. So it's pointless going through A star if you, it's not optimal, right? So uh, generally speaking, we're going to assume that it's admissible. So, but that is a good point. You could have heuristics and you, if those are not admissible, then you can throw them out, okay? Uh, but what other ways can you reduce the amount of space? So, excuse me, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we, can, uh, we can limit the number of paths that we yeah. want to search. So we could simply put a limit. We could say that, in the, as in the example that I, I uh, in, the, uh, in the homework assignment, I said that if the branching factor is more than B, then you're going to go through DFS, right? So you could have similar algorithms. I mean, you can literally come up with your own algorithms every day, okay? And you can publish a paper if that comes out to have some advantages. So you could actually limit the, uh, and this is the official, the so-called uh, BEAM method, right? What BEAM does is it says, I'm going to limit my, I'm going to have a BEAM, okay? It's not going to look at uh, all the paths, 
I'm going to say that I'm going to have a certain width, my beam width, and if it's beyond that beam, I'm going to simply forget it. Now, find that is the number of paths, okay? So you could say, I'm going to order it as you suggested, and I'm only going to take the, the least two costs, okay? Or the all the costs which are less than, or I'm going to take uh, the least, uh, all the, it could be based on a certain cost, or it could be based on a certain um, a beam, beam width, okay? B is simply the number of branches. So you could say, I'm only going to take the bottom two branches, or I'm going to take at all the branches in which the cost is less than C, okay? This, I haven't seen this algorithm uh, being talked about, but this is the one that is normally talked about, okay? You could come up with another algorithm, okay? And you could, you could propose that. So this is all that beam search is, okay? Now in the greedy search, if you look at B, what, uh, if B is a number, what is B in the case of the greedy search? which is using heuristics, what is B? In the, in the greedy search, uh, what are you limiting yourself to a certain number of branches? Are you li limiting yes, yourself to uh, B branches? No, so what would be the value of B in the case of sir, B? So wouldn't it be one? Would it be one? One yes, implies sir. that you're limiting it only to uh, the least cost search. If it's two, you're limiting yourself to two costs, two, the lowest two. So what is actually greedy doing? It's not it's limiting, limiting itself. So what is B? B is what? 10, B to the power. Uh, it's a number. So B is the, nu is the number of paths that you're going to uh, keep exploring. So in the case of greedy search, what is that number that you're going to keep on exploring? Two. In the greedy search, you, you're going to go through a breadth for a search. Number one. So it's actually the number of branches. And that could be, it could be, you know, the actual branching factor, the maximum branching factor. But since you're not putting a limit on the number of branches, then B is essentially, is it zero? Is it one? Is it infinity? It's actually infinity. Okay, so you can think of the beam search with B. If B is equal to infinity, then it basically becomes the greedy search. Okay, it's going to explore all the possible paths. If B is some values, let's say five or two, then you're limiting yourself to the last two or five least cost searches. Okay, G. Yes. Yeah, so, so essentially, if you can think of it, this is your greedy algorithm, all right? Greedy heuristic based. And this is um, your beam based method. And now beam, if this, if the B value goes to infinity, then this basically can, becomes the, the general case of the greedy algorithm, okay? But generally B is not assumed to be infinity. It's supposed to be, you're supposed to limit it to some number, right? Which is a non-infinite non number. So if you limit it to some number, 5, 10, 20, then you're actually limiting your beam, okay? But if you're making it infinite, it's essentially like doing a global search, okay? Now, what happens if you, and when would you want to make B is equal to one? And what does that imply? If you make your beam width equal to one, what does that imply? We're only going to explore the least cost method. Okay, now what would be the pros and cons of that? G. So say that again. Why would you have an infinite loop? Yeah. Okay, so it might, uh, yeah, so if the, yes, that's possible. So if the, if, if the, if the tree search actually has, an, has some depths which are infinite, then it could result in infinite. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. If, we, if we're doing, uh, you know, a limit to that, or if you're making sure that there are no loops, 
So that's not the problem, okay? But uh, the advantage of making B equal to one is what? What's, what's the advantage? Less time or less space? Less space. Clearly it's going to use less space because it's forgetting about all the other searches. It's going to take less time to get to the optimal solution. Will it get to the optimal solution? Will it get to the optimal solution of B is equal to one? It, no, somebody's no. shaking their head. It won't, right? Because you've said that this is the least, it seems to be the least cost based on heuristic. Now, why did the A star algorithm work? Because we actually kept track of the other paths, okay? And we have that in our memory. And when we got to the destination, we said, wait a second, I'm not, I'm here at the destination, but I'm going to double check with other paths which were still there in memory. And is this really the best? But in this case, in the, in the case of B is equal to one, what we're really saying is that we're just going to forget about everything else, okay? We've taken the least cost over here and we're just going to go down that path, okay? And does it guarantee an optimality? No, right? Because we think this seems to be the best path. I'm just going to forget about it. I've, I've gone through, uh, you know, the Ari Express or let's say Shahid Miller Express here from Defense and I'm not even going to try to I've ended up with a deadlock over here. Maybe the traffic is very high, but this is it. I'm going to keep going in that direction. So it forgets about where it's, it's like you have amnesia, right? You, you have forgetfulness, you have forgotten where you came from. So all of this is forgotten in B is equal to one. You just ending up going in a particular direction, you end up with this. So basically what you do is taking a step and uh, you, you actually really don't have a big picture in mind. Normally, when you're doing a search, you have the big picture in mind, right? You're trying to find, you're sitting at home, you're trying to find the optimal search, and you, you're actually planning all of that. And uh, once you found the optimal path, then you actually embark on it. With, with B is equal to one, you're sort of assuming that I'm going to, I'm not going to do a full search. I'm not going to keep memory because I don't even remember. I have short, short memory, right? So I'm going to start this, uh, I'm going to start jumping. Okay, I'm going to actually start going in each direction. Whichever direction shows me the least cost, I'm going to go there. That shows me the least cost. It's going to jump from state to state. And the only thing it's going to look at is which is the least cost path from here. Okay, and has no memory at all. Okay, so this is a, uh, this is, this has some advantages. Um, and if you look at, if you think about all the possible uh, pros and cons of this, um, it, it has a number of advantages. The basic advantage is that uh, it has very little memory to be used, okay? And because um, it doesn't keep other paths, it's very good for if you have extremely large problems, okay? So, uh, you know, those problems which are referred to as NP hard, okay? Which are, for example, the traveling salesman problem, okay? That's an extremely hard problem. And a lot of the other problems are also very hard. So in those cases, you don't actually have enough space to keep track of all the possible paths. Because if you try to do that, you just consume your entire space, okay? Numbers go up uh, humongously. So this is a good algorithm for a lot of uh, real world problems, okay? So um, now let's take a look to try to see what are the possible problems and how could be applied. For example, the eight puzzle that we've already familiar with. So let's say if H is 14 over here, H is 13, 14, and 15, which one would you choose? You choose this particular path. Would you keep track of these two? No, you would forget about these, right? And then you would say which is the, the least stick as you go forward, right? You've forgotten about where you came from and you've forgotten about all your other paths. You're just jumping from state to state and you're looking at all the possible least cost paths from there. Okay. Now, can you think of, is this possible in the eight puzzle? What do we have here? Heuristic of 14, 15, 15, 16. Do you think this is possible? Yes. And the current state, this is not the gold state. Is, do you think this is possible? It's possible, right? I mean, you've, and what would you call this? And what's the, what's the problem here? Can somebody spell it out? So the dead end problem. Sorry? 
So uh, the dead end in counter. It's a dead end. Problem. It's a dead end because you've actually found you're not at the goal, and you found that all the the paths that will that lead from here are actually higher cost. Okay, but you know that you haven't actually reached the goal because you have a certain goal in mind, right? And you haven't reached there. G. Okay, so if if it was thirteen, 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 then you're then you're at this case. Okay, everything is fine. You have you have paths which are lower cost, so you can go there. But the problem is that this could be a problem, right? That it is possible if you have lower cost paths, then that everything is fine. But what if you don't have a lower cost path? And what I'm trying to tell you is that it is possible not to be at the final goal, but to be at a Local problem, dead end. Okay. Did you see that somewhere? I mean, uh, you you haven't so far explored the frog jumping problems. Have, how many people have actually attempted that yet? Did you find some dead ends over there? Yes, there were dead ends, right? So you you took a particular direction and you got to a dead end. Now imagine that if you applying this particular algorithm, which was b is equal to one, a low which is called a local search because you don't have the global picture. And you're just trying to find the least cost, but you're at the dead end. Okay, so what do you do there? Well, the the uh, the local search uh, uh, problem says you just quit and you just stop over there. That's the best you can do. Okay, that's what the local search argument says. But you think it's a it's a good argument? It's a good algorithm. G. We go back. So so what did I say? In the local search, you you've forgotten where you came from. The only thing that you're going to do, you're not going to backtrack, okay? Remember, I said that you're not going to backtrack. You're only, you're only, are only going to look at possible other paths from there, which are subsequent paths, which are not backtracking, and those are lower cost. So in this particular case, it's going to say the algorithm is the least cost. The the local search algorithm is going to say, I'm just going to stop. It's a simple algorithm, okay? G. Okay, very good point. But uh, I'll show you an example. Um, I'll show you some examples. So here's a local search problem. Okay, it's slightly different. It's in a. It's sort of in a state space, which is sort of sort of shown as um, as continuous. Okay, but you can think of it as discrete as well. So suppose that here's the cost. Okay, here's the heuristic value. This was 14 over here. This was 13. You're merely going in the right direction. 12, 11, and then. You stuck at a local minima, and both the paths over there are basically telling you that you've reached your 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 minimum point. Okay, you can't go, you can't take any step from here, which is actually going to be better than the current minimum. And what we're saying is that it is not at a global minimum. In other words, over here in the eight puzzle, the heuristic should have given you the heuristic of your final goal should have been zero, right? You actually finally at the goal, but here you are at a heuristic of 11, and it's saying there is no better path. So this is basically what is referred to as a local minimum, as compared to a global minimum. And it's quite possibly in a lot of problems. And here are some other examples. So uh, here is the eight queen problem. Um, I'll just briefly tell you what the eight queen problem is. It says that you have to find, you know how queens work, right? They can go in diagonal as well as horizontal and vertical directions. You have to place a total of eight queen, which is possible, on a chessboard, without any one of them actually challenging each other. Okay, so can you find a spot over here which is solving the problem? It's almost solved the problem. Can anybody quickly solve this problem? So look at this. Uh, this particular, uh, these columns are not possible because you've already got somebody here. So is this free? Yes, yeah, this free. Is this possible? No. This one, right? So if you have it over here, uh, none of the queens are actually challenging e each other. Is that right? Okay, good. Somebody who's good at chess can immediately figure that out. So we we solved the the eight queen problem. Oh, gee. Sorry. No, no, no. There's no black and white. This is 
an eight queen problem is not chess. It's just using a chess board and it's using eight queens. Remember, they're not. It's not possible to have eight queens in normal chess. So the problem is that given that you have a chess board and you have eight queens, all of the same color, can you place them on a chess board such that no two of them actually challenge each other? That's the whole definition. Okay. So what we've done is we found a local solution, as an optimal solution. This is the global solution. Okay. But if you look at this particular problem over here, this is telling you that. I found, and this is in the book, so you can read it up. This is saying that in case of B, uh, can you find the problem here? There are two queens which are challenging each other. I think these two, right? So these two guys are challenging each other, not guys, but gals, okay? So they're challenging each other. So it is almost at the optimal solution, but what they're saying is that this is a local minimum. Okay. In other words, any any move that you make, and the idea is that you move your one of the queens, right? So, and this is not obvious immediately, but what they're claiming is that uh, if you make any movement over here of any of the pieces, you'll actually have come to a worse heuristic. And they've assumed a certain heuristic. Okay. I haven't told you what the heuristic is, but basically based on some heuristic, which is perhaps how many um, you know how many queens are challenging each other. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So what it's saying is that this is an example of a lo local heuristic. Okay. So um, real-world problems are extremely complex. So uh, this this is sort of representing on the vertical axis the heuristic cost, or it could be any cost, and uh, in two dimensions is trying to show you possible directions in which you could go. Okay. Imagine uh, uh, in in the binary search. You can go in two directions, right? In chess, what they say is that you can go typically have 35 different paths. So you would have a 35 dimension problem. So a real world problem is extremely complex. And if you're trying to find a global minimum, there'll be lots of local minimum. Okay. And the question is, how do you get out of the local minimum? How do you get to the optimal solution? And this is one of the perhaps the um, frontiers of operations research and a lot of AI problems. Uh, even most of AI research today is actually trying to solve this optimization problem. So if you think about self-driving cars today, machine learning, you know, uh, any any example that you can think of, uh, image captioning, what have you, neural net, uh, natural language processing, okay, being able to understand somebody's speech, being able to figure out what's going on, all of that actually is the one of the fundamental problems in all of this is to be able to find a either a global minimum or a global maximum, okay? If you're looking for a global maximum, you're trying to find this peak, but you have lots of peaks in between. So if you start off at any particular point, how do you get to the destination without doing a completely exhaustive search, which as we know is extremely uh, either, either time or space con con uh, you know, intensive. So uh, let's stop over here. Uh, this sort of tells you what the challenge in AI is and there are going to be lots of ways that you can actually solve it. So we'll take a look at different ways that one can solve this problem.